The Eagle and the Lion has now been out in the UK for a couple of months and Roman Persia was just released only last week in America. Now the book had a few nice reviews, very kind of people. I thought I'd do another, just a little video this time, a shorter one if I can keep my long-winded nature under control and just talk a little bit about one of the military aspects of the book. So obviously this is a book about a lot of warfare and I'd like to talk about the way the rival military systems work. Now I've dealt with this to some extent in detail about the early main encounter at Kahai and you can see that video on this site. But more generally, if you look at the overview, and that's what this book is about, it is about the long term, century after century of competition. Lots of conflicts, but they don't really seem to change things that much. Territory is sometimes gained or lost. Um, there's that gradual advance of the Roman frontier in the first, but particularly the second centuries AD. But even that is nibbling at the edges of the Parthian and then Persian Empire. There aren't, whilst there are brief periods in, um, under Mark Antony in the 40 BC where Syria, Judea is all overrun by the Parthians, they, they, they lose it very quickly. It's only there for a few years. And most of the big expeditions, Antioch is sacked several times by successive kings of kings, but they can't stay there until you get to the 7th century in that last war between Khosrow and Heraclius when the Romans lose a lot of territory relatively quickly, then on the whole the balance doesn't change too much. There are successes, there are failures, but in the end it's more about prestige, about how favourable a treaty you'll negotiate. So this is quite an interesting period that you have seven and a half centuries of contact, periods of conflict, and yet no one side gains a permanent overwhelming advantage. And certainly, until perhaps again with the war against Heraclius in that period where it looks as if the Roman Empire might be destroyed at that point, the Persians are so successful they come very close to doing this. Other than that, you don't have that situation at any other time. It simply isn't like that. Even the major Roman expeditions that march down the Euphrates, the Tigris Valleys, go and burn Tessiphon, Seleucia on the Tigris, they don't stay. And it's really unclear just what Trajan was planning had his campaigns not gone so badly wrong as rebellions start to erupt throughout the, the occupied territory. But even if his province of Assyria is seen as quite big, it would still have left the bulk of the Parthian Empire independent under the rule of a king of kings. And one of Trajan's last attempts to, to win, really, is by proclaiming his own man of king of kings, backing one of the candidates for the throne, and trying to rule in a very traditional way through an ally who's favourable to you, but not someone that you're actually going to direct day to day or that will be anything other than independent. Yes, he should be favourable to Rome, but he's certainly not a puppet ruler. He is still going to be king of kings of a very substantial, very wealthy, very militarily strong empire. But when you look at this, you start to think, well, OK, the military systems of the two sides, particularly at the start, seem very different. Again, more detail on this in the discussion of Carhai. Famously, the Roman army is based around the Roman legion. The legionary is a foot soldier, heavily armoured, with his short gladius sword, his big um, rectangular oval scutum, well protected. He's got the pilum, a very short range, heavy javelin, delivers a very hefty punch, but he's very aggressive. He's got to get close. He's going to try and get close, kill you, terrify you, drive you off, massacre you when you run away. And he's good at sieges and that sort of thing. In contrast, you have the Parthians with their horse archers, with their cataphracts, far more mobile troops. Cavalry armies, a uh, cavalry army primarily rather than an infantry-based army. Both of those are oversimplifications and will particularly change as the armies develop. It's very hard to trace the composition of Parthian armies because it comes back to something I talked about in the previous video and in others at various times. We have detailed descriptions of Carhai. We have a little bit about Serena's army there, although, again, we don't really know how many men he had and what type they were um, altogether at Carhai. But we know even less about subsequent Parthian armies, the ones who drove back 
uh, Mark Antony's expedition into Medea, the ones that participated in the fighting in Armenia in Nero's reign, let alone the ones that are um, face up to Trajan's armies and all the others in the second century AD. There may well have been more Parthian infantry, more contingents of men who fought on foot in at least some armies than we allow for. And we don't really know how these armies were intended to work and how they generally, how tactically the system worked. We're guessing. And, you know, there's, there's even that interesting point where it may just be a rhetorical flourish. Tacitus likes his antitheses, where he compares the Sarmatians fighting as ally to one of the claimants in Armenia against um, the Parthian-backed candidate. And the Sarmatians are seen as keener to get to hand-to-hand -hand combat than the Parthians. Now, not something you'd think of for a cataphract, but then again, the stereotypical Parthian warrior for a Roman is always the horse archer. So you have apparently a confrontation of two different systems at that period. The striking thing in the campaigns under Nero, particularly Corbulo's successful expeditions, is that he doesn't really fight much in the open, but he moves along in um, a sort of hollow square, the um, Agmen Quadratum, the, the um, formation where you protect your baggage and you stop yourself being surrounded, outflanked, but you keep together. You fight as a coherent unit, which just means the Parthians don't fight you at all because that's too dangerous to take on. And if they can't lure you out to break up, which they only manage to do once or twice with small contingents, then they're faced with the fact that, oh, well, they've got to accept that we can't deal with you. Maybe we'll wait till another day, try and fight you then when it's more to our advantage. Very sensible, pragmatic way of fighting does seem to fit in with the portrayal of the system that you have, you see at Kahai and the like, but again, might be oversimplified, has a lot to do with the ground and the nature of the forces you have available at the time of the encounter. The big thing we see with the Roman army, the big change that occurs and is confirmed under Augustus, may have been underway already, but certainly under Augustus and the Julio-Claudians, the move towards the professional permanent Roman army with its formal units of auxilia as well as the legions, so that any Roman army now consists of significant numbers of cavalry. It tends to have archers, particularly um, campaigns fought in the eastern part of the empire, where there are more units um, attested, at least given the title of being archers, more auxiliary cohorts and some cavalry units as well. So you have horse archers sometimes, you have lots of infantry archers, you have quite a lot of good, disciplined, expensive, well-mounted, prestigious cavalry units. You don't get the cataphracts, you don't get the contari, the lancers, at least in significant numbers till a bit later. But again, those will develop. Uh, seems to be happening more late first century and into the second century AD. You've always got to be careful. Sometimes you define the Roman army and its units as simply what they have a title for. And that doesn't necessarily mean that certain types of equipment and tactics aren't in use before a unit is formally recognized as being horse archers, as being cataphracts or whatever it might be. But the Roman army of this period is a well-balanced all-arms force, and it's very good at sieges. And the pattern of warfare, when it's described, and again, those descriptions are limited of the, the wars under Nero, is of not pitched battles in the open, but of siege after siege. The Romans are able to move where they want to go, and it's very difficult for the Parthians to stop them. And the Romans are then able and willing to attack fortified settlements and to capture them either by direct assault or blockade or convincing the um, defenders to surrender, whether through starvation or terror. We don't hear in detail of Parthian armies taking walled cities and strongholds in the same way. But again, that may reflect the sources. We are, after all know that in, in Parthian civil wars, in fighting elsewhere, they do take cities. So Serena, the man who defeats Crassus at Carhai, had supposedly being the first man over the wall um, when capturing um, Seleucia, not long before in the civil war between the royal brothers. So they can do it. And although Dio writing in the early third century says that the Parthians aren't very good at sieges, they don't have good infantry, they can't stay in one place, can't feed all their horses, there may well be some truth in that. They're probably not as good at it as the Roman army of this period is. But we should be a little bit careful about saying not being good means you can't do it at all, because clearly they can at some times. And 
these campaigns give the impression of being waiting for someone to make a mistake. When a Roman commander like Cassianus Paetus does make mistakes and loses heart, he loses badly and quickly. When a Roman commander is more careful, knows what he's doing, the Parthians can't force him to battle in a situation that favours them. They can't also stop him from going where he wants to go and they can't stop him from taking their walled strongholds. Similarly, when a Parthian commander makes a mistake, the Romans get an opportunity for victory. But more often than not, the skilled ones are able to avoid the Roman field armies. But again, it's, it's harder for them to protect their, their cities and their strongholds. So that seems to be the pattern of warfare. But remember, we are dealing with very, very scanty evidence. And the really big wars of the second century are so poorly known that we don't understand. There appear to be, from the epitomes of Dio and the like, some battles the Romans win, some they lose. Most they win in these campaigns, but there are some defeats. But we don't know what happened in each case. Who made the mistakes? Was one side very inept? Was one side very good in that particular situation? Impossible to say. We also don't really know what the Parthian army looks like in this period. And there is a tendency, the simple answer is that when the Sasanian Persian dynasty takes over in the third century, to see their armies as fundamentally different. But again, we need to be careful because we don't get detailed descriptions of the battles that they fight and win against the Romans in the third century. You know, we don't know really what happens at Edessa in 260 when um, Valerian is captured. We don't know about, you know, you get the different traditions. The Persians claim, Shapur I claims to have defeated and killed Gordian III in battle. The Romans say he dies afterwards and there might be suspicions of treachery and all this sort of thing and is buried some way away. But the, the Romans won the battle but lose the campaign because the emperor dies. Which side is telling the truth? Very hard to say at this distance. And, you know, from one point of view, obviously the, the Persian view is right in the sense they win the war because though that Roman campaign does not succeed, whatever tactical victories they may or may not have achieved earlier on, strategically it is a failure. So Shapur I is certainly right to claim to be the victor because he is, but quite how the victory happened is, is harder to say. And it, it's interesting from a historian's point of view, but in perhaps in the political context, it doesn't matter quite so much because the winner is clear. But we're always obsessed with, well, how does this happen? You know, why did it happen? That sort of thing. By the time we start to see the Persian army in a little bit more detail, we're really getting into the 4th century and Ammianus' um, accounts of the campaigns there, which is interesting and it tells us more. And we start to see um, the, path in, uh, sorry, the Persian ability at siegecraft is as great, if not in some cases, it sometimes comes across as even slightly better than Roman capacity by this period. The Persians can very definitely besiege and capture strongly walled cities and forts. That, however, is the bulk of the fighting that is described. Ammianus doesn't give us a detailed account of any pitched battle in the open. Now, you get these, these rapid encounters, these whirling fights, but it's quite, um, then they don't seem to be that formal as engagements when Julian is facing the Persians off. So you don't get a bit, that campaign is not decided by a big battle. It's the sieges, then the Roman retreat, and then the death of Julian <clears throat> that bring that to a conclusion and ensure the Persian victory. He does tell us an awful lot about sieges. Now, obviously, in sieges, whilst we hear about the Parthian cavalry sweeping in beforehand, cutting off refugees, surprising, ravaging the, the land, this sort of thing, cavalrymen do not play a major part in attacks on cities themselves. That's not what they do. Presumably, many of them are fighting dismounted, particularly the nobility. Um, so you might have cataphracts leading assaults, but we, we don't get descriptions of them doing what they're doing. There is an overall trend. You see from the third century, you get mention of war elephants that then become more common. They occur in the fourth. They will appear or not. They don't really appear to any extent to Procopius. Um, but then they seem to pop up again later. So there's a perception that the Persians sometimes use them and sometimes have them, but these can be frightening. They're big and they're scary in Ammianus, but um, just how common? Now, obviously, a war elephant is not a, a method of waging war that's designed to skirmish. This is very different from the old horse archer, rushes in, shoots, and disappears, still shooting, 
and then weakens you, wears you down, wears you down, eats away at you, but never lets himself be caught at a disadvantage. He waits until you're so weary and so weak that he can just sweep you away. It's a system of fighting based on maneuver, on evasion, on skill, on coming in quick, going out quickly. It's wearing the enemy down. And that's certainly in the, the Kahai description, that's the, the bulk of what the Parthians are doing, backed up by a smaller cataphract force that is designed to sweep you away, but that has the sense under a good commander like Serena to wait until the enemy is ripe to be ridden down, is likely to break when you attack them. That's not the impression you get of Persian warfare even in the fourth century for these battles. The Persians seem to have far more heavy cavalry, more of the cataphract type, more of the clibinarii. Um, the distinction between the two is a, a source of debate, but um, these are cavalry where the man certainly is very heavily armoured and often the horse is also protected by metallic or fabric armour of some sort. These are not, you know, that, that means a fairly heavy weight on the horse itself. The Sasanian Persian ones certainly are very often archers and you don't hear so much about lances and the contours, though they're clearly still there um, with at least some men, but you more often hear about swords, maces, this sort of thing. But they, they have this capacity, but they also, they shoot a lot. And this will be the trend. You'll get to the point where by the 6th century, when you look at Procopius, when you look at the descriptions of the Persians in um, the Strategicon, where these are very much a close order force that means to go close to the enemy, confront the enemy, attack them directly, first of all with missile fire, with all these waves and waves of arrows, and then with a charge. So you're willing to fight hand to hand, but you do like to wear the enemy down first. But you're not doing the old fashioned light horse archer thing with his unencumbered mount where you shoot a bit, then you run away when anyone comes close to you. If you come close to Persian cavalry like that, they will fight you very doggedly hand to hand and they will charge you as well more often. They are not waiting until you are overwhelmed before they sweep in. So the Sasanian Persian armies give an impression of being far more confrontational, being far more interested in close combat and being very good at it as well than the image we have of earlier Parthian, Parthian armies where mobility in battle itself and on the battlefield itself and not just in the run-up to the battlefield is important. To the extent even in the Strategicon where the Romans you know, advise against fighting them in open terrain, fine broken terrain to fight the Persians because they're too good in the open. Now you could see this as, in a sense, it's the Persians moving to be more like the Roman enemy. Now. The Romans have always been very confrontational up until this point, and that's the whole point of the legionary. Get close, hammer the enemy, break through, smash him, pour your reserves in to exploit the gap, hunt him down with your cavalry then afterwards. The Persians are doing something very similar, whereas the Parthians have worked on the basis that, well, we'll, we'll weaken them first, then we'll fight them. The problem with that is, is that in certain circumstances, it can allow the Roman armies to march wherever they want to go to besiege whichever city they want to besiege. The Persians have reached a point where they're saying, actually, we are going to hit you head on and we don't mind slugging it out with you toe to toe and face to face. Yes, we're still bowmen. Archery is still very important to us. It's culturally important, but also we're very good at it. But we're going to shoot you down from fairly close range. And when you come at us, we are not going anywhere. We are not running away. We are going to fight you. And if it needs to be done sword in hand, mace in hand, we're going to do that. And we're as good and as brave and as mean as you and we will win. So it's the two armies becoming quite similar in many respects. And it might be that this is a response to Roman ways of doing it, to the Romans having gained an advantage for a while where they can move wherever they want to go, to a reformed um, army saying, well, actually, no, we're willing to fight and we can beat you in battle in an open fight without having to wear you down because that's what we're doing. There may be other reasons for this. It's, it would be wonderful to have some idea of what Parthian armies are like in the second and early third century. Has there been a move towards this more con confrontational way of fighting where you add in the elephants and infantry are a little more prominent? Now, many of them are still dismissed as fairly low quality, unenthusiastic levies, and many of them are maybe relegated to the, the donkey work and the laboring work in sieges or as garrisons, but they're there. They're more prominent. And war elephants, again, are something that are not made for rapid mobility. 
They are there to confront, to terrify, and if necessary, trample down the enemy. Obviously, yes, you've got your archers in the, up on its back shooting them down as well, but it's, it's, a, it's a shock weapon. It's designed, it's always a risky one because they can panic and trample your own side, but it's designed to intimidate, frighten, beat down the enemy in close combat or by the threat of close combat. The whole point is an elephant's scary because it's this dirty great thing coming straight at you. So you've had a move of into a Persian army that is much more confrontational, designed primarily for close combat or relatively close combat with, with archery beforehand. There's also a move, you get the shift when you finally see the Roman army, when you start getting descriptions of from Procopius's days of Justinian's army in the field, where the Roman army has actually become quite different to that of the earlier period. It's no longer so infantry-centered. There are still more infantrymen than cavalrymen in most armies. They're not quite all. Um, but they are used in a more static way. And you, you could even see this, you could pick it in some ways, look at Ammianus' account of the Battle of Strasbourg against the Alemanni, where he emphasizes, you know, Roman units, cohorts, standing like towers. Uh, now, obviously, again, the rhetoric's coming in, but there's a sense where you haven't necessarily got the old tradition of the legionary, which is you charge, you throw your peeler, you hit the enemy hard at very close range, and then you slam into him and you beat him down with the boss of your shield and stab him with your gladius. And even when you're defending, as you do against Boudicca, yes, you wait in position till they come to you, but then you throw your peeler, you charge, you scream, you hit them hard. It's very aggressive. There is a trend towards a slightly less aggressive approach that you can see to some extent, or you can appears to be there towards the later empire. It's not as simple as that, but there is an emphasis on this. By the time you get to Procopius in the, the battles against the Persians and to some extent elsewhere, mostly the Roman infantry is used in a, an entirely static role. And they are formed blocks behind which your cavalry can rally when they, they fought, they can retreat, they can reform, rest their horses, form up again and go forward again. And your main aggressive arm is the cavalry. A cavalry that is now, a lot of it quite well armored, a lot of it also consists of horse archers. Some of them, particularly the various recruits of Huns and the others, relatively light horse archers. So there is a move towards similarity. And when you look at the armies described in the Strategicon, the difference between the Roman army and the Persian army is, is not that great. And many of the things that the, the Romans say about the Persians and how they fight and how sneaky they are and all this sort of thing, the Persians would surely say about the Romans. So you've had, I think, over this period, something that cannot always be traced in detail, but basically a back and forth between the two sides. One side is able, through a tactic or a style of fighting or equipment, to gain an advantage, but for a relatively short time. The other one has the ingenuity, has the will, has the skill to counter this. They either get a version of the same thing for themselves, so you know the Romans will copy cataphracts, they'll copy horse archers, all of these sorts of things, the Parthians, the Persians, will move ever heavier. Now, it's possible as well that there are other cultural aspects going on as to why there seem to be far more very heavy cavalry around in Sasanian Persian armies, particularly the later you go, than there had been earlier. And there don't seem to be these hordes of horse archers, or if they are, they're relegated to a, a role that's really away from the battlefield. They're not the key arm anymore. Is that a reflection of greater prosperity? Is this a change in society that you've got far more people wealthy enough to have that equipment and to have the leisure time to train and practice to be this sort of horseman? And you have this tradition that will survive later on of the, the emphasis on the training of um, almost a knightly class, an elite class of horse fighters. Um, horse soldiers, really, um, amongst the Sasanian Persians. And to some extent, this might be as well greater wealth than nobility can afford a larger train of followers and make them better equipped. So there could be other changes going on, but it also seems to be a tactical response to, again, there's a back and forth. There, it is never one side that has the advantage permanently. With sometimes quickly, sometimes over a longer period, the other side works out how to deal with this enemy in a very logical, very human way. And again, it emphasizes the equality between the empires. You know, these are both sophisticated, militarily strong and capable groups. 
and they learn from their mistakes, not always quickly, but they do, and they find a way around, and then the other side gets an advantage. Um, there's, a, there's a nice illustration of how difficult it was to gain a permanent advantage over the enemy by um, the mention of the stirrup in the Strategicon. Now, you know, you'd think of this, and particularly medievalists for a long time used to portray this as a major revolution in how cavalry could fight and how they could deliver shock action, even though it did take quite a long time before the sort of classic couch launch of the, the high medieval knight actually develops. You know, the, the cavalry brought by William the Conqueror don't necessarily fight that way and are still throwing and thrusting over arm as much as they're doing anything else. But it used to be perceived, surely this is a great technological advantage. And as someone who was always deeply uncomfortable when uh, my riding instructor would get me to ride without stirrups, um, nevertheless, if you know how to do it, you can ride pretty well. And the, the good, right, good horsemen are um, very capable, even without stirrups, and particularly when you add in the saddles that are being used by both sides throughout this period, the four-horn saddle that's probably originated on the steppes and is certainly around with the Parthians and the Romans have it by the time of contact and probably substantially before. So this gives you a very good seat. It's probably true that the stirrup makes it easier to train people to become riders. They, they certainly gave me confidence, I'll have to admit that. Um, in the same way that you could argue that early muskets are less effective than something like the longbow, but it's a lot easier to train men to use them and to have massed armies that are fairly good quite quickly, whereas becoming a very good archer takes a long time and a lot of training and a lot of physical strength. But in the Strategicon, the, we don't know when the Romans discovered the stirrup, when it came along. We don't really know in too much detail where it originates and how it comes, presumably from the steppe somewhere, who brings it, who uses it first. And all of that has been lost. What we can say, though, is that when it does get mentioned, the Strategicon assumes that every Roman cavalryman will be riding with stirrups. It mentions it as part of the basic equipment of a horseman. The only other time it mentions them is actually talking about medics and how when a medic is helping a wounded man, he'll bring both stirrups over to one side so that both he and the casualty he'll be riding in front of him can put one foot in a stirrup and get some support. So something that is apparently comparatively new, maybe only been around for a generation or so, is now assumed to be so matter of fact, so normal, so every day, that you don't really need to talk about it at all. So presumably by this time, probably before the Romans, the, the Persians are also using stirrups, but it hasn't made too much of a difference. Perhaps it gave one side an advantage for a short period of time, but very quickly the other side copies it. And you can see that with developments in artillery, like the early, um, what become the trebuchets, um, that appear and start to be used. And even people like the Avars and, and tribal groups like that are using them quite quickly. And it, it does increase their capacity for taking cities, but it's, it's, again, it's an advantage that everybody gets very quickly. So the story of the arms race between the two sides probably has far more subtlety than we can see with the surviving evidence. But it is interesting in that it, it again emphasizes that how evenly matched, how similar in many ways the empires were and how there is a, a general trend. You can see it in lots of their behavior, in their government, in their diplomacy, how the two empires actually become more and more alike the longer they live beside each other and as time goes on. And they do clearly learn from each other whether they necessarily copy or find another way of gaining them advantage and destroying the advantage that the other side has from a certain thing, that's different. That depends on what works for them. Um, but it, it is a story of frequent change, of copying, of adaptation, of learning, of working out how to defeat the enemy. And in this, it never it stops and probably would have gone on and developed had the rivalry not come to a rather abrupt end as the Arab armies destroy the Sasanians and take away nearly all the, the provinces of the, um, of the Eastern Roman Empire that's left. So things will happen suddenly. And that's an interesting revolution that, again, we'd like to know far more about militarily, just how they do this. Are they doing something different? Are they just doing things that everybody knows how to do, but doing it better? So all the way through, you've got these elements and victories and defeats aren't necessarily explained by technology or better tactics because it can come down to decisions made 
on the day or days by individuals. And when you've got somebody good and others less good, that can have a huge influence on the outcome. So the military story is a big part of the book. They're not the only part. And this is just an introduction to the, the way of thinking about this and the overall pattern of the arms race between the two great empires.